Welcome to Mayo Clinic Sleep Medicine Podcasts, a series for physicians, advanced practice providers, nurses, and other health practitioners treating sleep disorders or interested in learning about state-of-the-art advances in sleep medicine and sleep health. I'm your host, Dr. Michael Silber. And I'm your co-host, Dr. Maitri Juna. We are both consultants at the Center for Sleep Medicine at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Thank you all for joining us for today's podcast titled Eating While Asleep. There are many connections between sleep and eating, including the relationship between narcolepsy and obesity, the higher frequency of obstructive sleep apnea in patients with increased weight, and rare syndromes such as Klein-Levin and Prader-Willi syndromes. One of the stranger conditions that sleep specialists occasionally see is that of sleep-related eating disorder. To discuss this syndrome and its management, my guest today is Dr. Michael Silber, a professor of neurology and a board-certified sleep specialist at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Mike, thank you for joining us today. Could you tell us a bit about what is sleep-related eating disorder and how does it differ from night eating syndrome and other eating disorders? Well, thank you, Maithri. It's, I suppose, not surprising that sleep and eating are closely related, both fundamental biologic drives, both with neuronal centers in the hypothalamus. So a link would seem pretty inevitable. So what is sleep-related eating disorder? These are patients who will get up in the night and eat, they will walk to the kitchen, they will prepare food sometimes, and sometimes eat very strange combinations of food. They eat sloppily with mess. They often take food back to the bed and in the morning find crumbs in the bed and mess on their table. Um, They have, as you might imagine, amnesia for the events. But it isn't always complete amnesia. Sometimes it's partial amnesia, and they can vaguely remember going to the kitchen or doing something together with food. And it can vary from night to night whether they have complete or partial amnesia. Um, As you might imagine, the condition is related to sleepwalking, to the non-REM slow-wave parasomnia of sleepwalking, but there are some differences. Whereas most people who sleepwalk start in childhood, early childhood, first decade, and just if they're going to persist into adulthood, they persist. Um, Sleep eaters tend to start eating in their tw- um, between the age of 20 and 30 years and haven't done it earlier. And whereas both men and women equally sleepwalk, Sleep-related eating disorder is far more common in women. Um, 60 to 80% of patients reported have been female. Um, Also, the partial amnesia, which is characteristic of the disorder in many patients, also unusual in sleepwalking, where there's usually complete amnesia. But there is a relationship, and I'm sure we'll come back to that later in this discussion. Sleep-related eating disorder is different from night eating syndrome in that night eaters eat consciously. There is no amnesia at all. They know perfectly well they're going to eat. They are hungry at night. They consume at least 25% of their calories at night. They don't eat unusual food, though it can be high caloric food. They have early morning satiety, as you might imagine, but so can the sleep-related eating disorder patients. They put on weight, but so can the sleep-related eating disorder patients do that. And there is even a closer relationship, because if you take someone who's a night eater and give them hypnotics, especially short-acting benzodiazepine receptor agonists, they may convert their conscious night eating into unconscious sleep-related eating. So it's complex. Sleep-related eating disorder is also different from the more classic daytime eating disorders, such as um, anorexia and bulimia. That can happen in the evening, but the characteristics, both the psychiatric characteristics and the clinical characteristics are very different. Very helpful and fascinating. You alluded to this a little bit uh, just a moment ago, but could you speak a little bit more to the relationship between sleep-related eating and the use of hypnotic medications, Mike? Yes, this is a very interesting characteristic of it. Um, We reported quite some years ago five patients who, when they started using Zolpidem, started sleep-related eating. And this has now been widely accepted that it's a rare 
complication or side effect of zolpidem use. Um, is it specific for zolpidem? No one's really looked at this in any detail, but most experts think it probably isn't in any short-acting hypnotic at night, maybe in the benzodiazepine class, can sometimes cause sleep-related eating. We don't think it's as common, with, if at all, with longer-acting benzodiazepines such as clonazepam, which is actually one of the ways to try to treat the disorder. But I always warn my patients, if I'm going to use zolpidem or similar drugs, you know, one of the rare condition things that can happen is sleepwalking, which can happen, and sleep eating, which is perhaps a commoner than ordinary classic sleep walking. So, yes, there is a relationship to these short-acting um, hypnotics, though it's not the whole story by any means. So in addition to exploring sedative hypnotic use in these patients, are there other factors that are associated with sleep-relating eating disorder that clinicians should explore in patients suspected of having this condition? Yes, definitely. Let's start with other drugs. It's been reported with neuroleptics, a range of neuroleptic um, antipsychotic agents. It's been reported with lithium. It's actually been reported with sodium oxybate. Um, and my experience is it, the pa some of the patients I see are often on multiple psychotropic medications, and you don't know whether it's just one of them or just the combination. So yes, other psychotropic drugs can certainly be associated with it. Then the other vitally important thing is to explore other sleep disorders. Um, there are, going back to our five patients years ago on Zolpidem, they almost all had restless legs and sleep apnea as well. And there's a definite relationship to restless leg syndrome. Nice study um, from the University of Minnesota some years ago um, showing this quite definitely that restless legs patients have a higher frequency of sleep-related eating and night eating. Um, and interestingly, those who were on, again, the short-acting benzodiazepines tended to develop sleep-related eating in the setting of restless legs or convert their night eating in the setting of restless legs into sleep-related eating. And what was nice about that study uh, that Mike Howell was the first author um, demonstrated he, they had a control group of psychophysiologic insomnia patients who were also some of them put on short-acting benzodiazepine receptor agonists, and they didn't have the same frequency of sleep-related eating. So it seemed to be the combination of restless legs and the drug which did it. Um, there, there, some case series have shown a moderate frequency of sleep apnea in sleep-related eating disorder patients, perhaps higher than the population. That's rather uncertain. And um, it's also reported in narcolepsy among many parasomnias that we see in narcolepsy. So it's important to look at other sleep disorders and then in the same sort of category, a lot of patients who eat at night do sleepwalk occasionally under other circumstances. They may sleepwalk into the bathroom or elsewhere. And as I said, there is a relationship to it. Not all of people do it. So many sleep-related eating disorder patients just eat. They don't do other things. But there's definitely a relationship with other parasomnias. And then there is probably also a relationship with psychiatric disease, affective disorders, anxiety disorder, previous substance abuse. Um, some of the bigger series came from Carlos Schenk um, in, Min in Minneapolis. And of course, Carlos is a um, sleep psychiatrist. So just, um, there may be a little bit of, of sampling bias in his series of patients, but I think we can we should be looking for psychiatric disorders as well. Now, I want to be very clear, not everybody with sleep-related eating disorder is on psychotropic drugs or has a psychiatric disorder by any means, but it's the things we should be looking at to try and address So, in order to try help. So if they have an underlying sleep disorder, treat the restless legs, treat the sleep apnea, um, and look at what possible modification to medications is possible. Take them off short-acting hypnotics, no question about that. And if they're on multiple other psychotropic drugs, work with the psychiatrist to reduce the drugs. So in addition to excluding and or addressing underlying sleep conditions, Mike, is a sleep study necessary to make this diagnosis? Mm -hmm. 
Well, of course, that raises the question is which stage of sleep does all this happen in? And it generally happens like classic sleepwalking in slow wave sleep, but it can happen also in N2 sleep, which is less common for sleepwalking. And there have been apparently reports of other stages as well, but the majority N2 or N3. Um, interestingly, the event seems to happen in alpha rhythm. Patient wakes suddenly and then goes to the bathroom to the kitchen. If you can record anything as they're getting out of bed, it seems to be alpha rhythm. Um, there's no obviously no epileptiform activity. So do you need a sleep study to diagnose it? Generally not, unless you're concerned about differential diagnosis, but there's not much else that looks like this. Um, seizures don't usually present in this way. On the occasion that I have studied these patients, I put food by the bed because I don't want them getting up and wandering around the sleep lab looking for food. And we've occasionally recorded videos of people taking candy or something from their table and, and eating it. Their main reason for doing a sleep study would be if you suspect sleep apnea or another sleep disorder that is diagnosable by polysomnography. So really, the main reason would be to rule out associated disorders so that you could treat them. Are there specific treatment options for sleep-related eating disorder? You spoke a little bit about the management yes. of the condition already, but how about specific treatment options? Well, in my experience, this is a difficult condition to treat. And again, I may be biased because I may see the most severe cases, the patients who have failed other treatments. And I'm always conscious that when one works in a academic tertiary institution, our own experience may be biased and we may be seeing worse cases than primary care doctors see. But the first thing to do is clearly identify precipitating factors, take them off the Zolpidem or other short-acting drugs, rationalize multiple psychotropic drugs as best as one can with the patient's well-being um, carefully kept in mind. Treat associated sleep disorders, especially restless legs and probably sleep apnea. And then when one's done all of that, the next question is what about sort of safety of the house environment? Well, I was once um, asked to give a talk on this and the topic I was given that was for me to talk on was lock the refrigerator door. So the question is, can one lock away the food? Well, obviously, refrigerator doors generally don't have locks. And it's really far more difficult than it seems. P um, patients seem to find food, whatever you do. Most kitchens are open plan these days. They aren't doors you can lock to a kitchen even. And trying to lock all the food away in closets is very impractical. So I've not found those things terribly helpful. There's a little anecdotal experience of hypnosis. I don't have experience with that in helping to treat this disorder, but it's something non-pharmacologic, which could also be considered. Um, and then just like any sleepwalking, one looks after general safety stairs. Most patients who eat, who eat in their sleep don't try to get out of windows or out of the house. Um, so what about drugs? Well, once one's treated the underlying sleep disorders, if they're present, this, the first line would often be clonazepam, just as we would use that for sleepwalking if it was injurious or disturbing, which obviously sleep-related eating disorder is. It sometimes works and often doesn't. Um, the drug, more specific drug that has been suggested is topiramate, which of course is an anti-epileptic drug used for many things, but it also is one of the drugs which actually suppresses appetite. And there've been a couple of studies, John Winkleman at Harvard has led these studies, an open label one, and then a nice controlled trial showing that topiramate does work in about 40% of patients in re at least reducing the amount they eat during sleep. Um, it's not an easy drug to tolerate. One starts at low doses, 25 milligrams before bed, and one builds up slowly. In John Winkleman's controlled study, the average dose was 125 milligrams, which is getting up there, certainly in my experience, with, because of side effects. It causes daytime sleepiness, paresthesias, changes in taste. Um, kidney stones can be a problem. There, You know, it's not a totally benign drug, and a lot of people don't um, like it and don't get up to high enough doses, but it is certainly something that can be tried.
There's some case reports of sertraline, um, the SSRI being successful, and that's a benign thing in, that one can try, 25 milligrams. And Carlos Schenk many years ago suggested that he had some patients who responded to levodopa and codeine in combination. I haven't experienced with that. There is a little trial of um, the dopamine agonists, such as Premipexel, which was not successful. But of course, if a patient does have restless legs and you choose to use a dopamine agonist, at least you'll suppress the restless legs component. But I don't think it's going to be specific for the sleep-related eating. In, in my experience, as I say, it's a very difficult condition to treat. And if you deal, dealt with all that, in my hands has remained a group of patients I just have not been very successful with. This is a very helpful review of the syndrome and its management. Mike, are there any final messages that you would like to leave with our listeners today? Well, parasomnias to sleep doctors anyway are very interesting phenomena. It's important to tease apart what's happening. Some of them can be very distressing. Patients with sleep-related eating who do it frequently are very distressed. They're putting on weight. It's socially embarrassing. Um, it's something we really want to help if we can. So eliminate the short-acting benzodiazepine agonists and rationalize other psychotropic drugs. Treat related sleep disorders, especially restless legs, and Try clonazepam, topiramate, maybe sertraline, and hope that you have some benefit and help for these for this distressing condition. Again, hypnosis is something else that might be tried. Thanks very much for sharing that helpful overview of the condition and its management. Mike, are there any final messages that you would like to leave with our listeners today? Yes, well, parasomnias are very interesting to sleep specialists, especially neurologists, but to patients, they can be quite distressing, especially sleep-related eating disorder. Patients are concerned about weight gain, the social embarrassment of doing it. It's distressing, and we should help them as best we can. So um, first, um, eliminate zolpidem and rationalize, if you can, other psychotropic agents. Second, treat related sleep disorders, especially restless legs. Third, consider more specific treatments. Hypnosis can be tried. Um, and then medication-wise, clonazepam, topiramate, perhaps sertraline, and see what best you can do to try and help these patients. Wonderful. Very helpful. Thank you all for joining our podcast today. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed this podcast. If so, please tune in again through wherever you receive your podcasts as we discuss further topics in sleep medicine and sleep health. Thank you.